Hey, what's up, guys? Today I'll show you a horror TV series named Creep Show Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled The House of the Head, begins with a shot of a beautiful dollhouse owned by a young girl named Evie. Inside the dollhouse lived the Smith family, which consisted of a mother, a father, their son, and a little dog. After school every day, Evie would rush to her room to check on the Smiths. One day, she noticed an extra doll's head had appeared on the dollhouse table. Moreover, she clearly remembered that when she left in the morning, the doll parents were lying in bed. But now they were sitting up, as if worried about something. The boy appeared scared, clutching his blanket. Even the little dog had moved. At some point, the detached head had fallen to the floor. To her shock, it even felt bloody to the touch. Before she could investigate further, she was called out of the room by her mother. When she returned home, she darted into her bedroom and opened the dollhouse again. The doll parents had descended the stairs, the detached head had moved to the sofa, and the little dog was shut outside. The boy leaned against the door. In the blink of an eye, the detached head had moved again, this time to the bed. Now, Evie became convinced the Smith's house was haunted. Frightened, she retreated to her own bed. The next day, Evie went to the doll store and purchased a doll police officer. She hoped the officer could help investigate the mysterious happenings at the Smith's house. During dinner, she quietly said a prayer for the Smiths. Before bedtime, she found that the dolls had moved once again. The doll officer had gone to the attic in search of the ghostly head. Suddenly, her father walked in, startling her. However, she didn't ask her father for help, only hugging him tightly before he left. Looking back at the dollhouse, the doll officer had also left the attic. Evie searched everywhere, only to find that the officer's head had been cut off. Panic swept through the Smith family, and Evie herself was terrified. She rushed to find the ghostly head, only to discover it was embedded in the mirror. Furious, she warned the ghostly head to stay away from the Smiths before diving under her covers. The next day, Evie returned to the doll shop. She told the owner that she urgently needed some dolls related to spiritual power, such as priests or mediums. The shopkeeper recommended her to buy a psychic doll. After placing the psychic doll in the dollhouse, Evie went downstairs to watch a movie with her parents. However, she was distracted throughout. Seeing her parents fall asleep, she tiptoed back to her room only to find the smiths staring at the ceiling. She looked outside the house and discovered the psychic doll's head had been cut off and the ghost head was hiding behind the smiths. She loudly warned them, but her voice attracted her mother. With no other choice, Evie lay in bed pretending to have had a nightmare. After her mother left, she quickly checked the dollhouse. Now, the doll parents' heads had been severed and the boy's head had been replaced with the ghost's. Frustrated, she yanked off the ghost head and threw it on the floor before diving under her covers. However, she realized she couldn't leave that evil thing in her room, so she crawled on the floor searching for the head only to find it had grown larger. Terrified, she quickly locked the head in the dollhouse. The following day, she begged her parents to remove the dollhouse. She didn't want anything more to do with this spooky thing. The second story, titled Grey Matter, begins on a stormy night when the government advised the citizens to evacuate urgently as a once-in-a-century hurricane was coming, potentially turning into a catastrophic storm. The sheriff, the doctor, and the supermarket owner were on night duty that day, worried about any unexpected needs of the residents. A boy named Timmy pushed open the door. He came to buy beer for his father. The owner saw that something was wrong with him and asked what happened. After a series of questions, Timmy revealed that his father had changed and he did not want to go home. The owner decided to keep him in the store while the sheriff and the doctor went to Timmy's house to investigate. After a gust of wind, the lights in the house went out. The owner lit a kerosene lamp for Timmy, and after preparing him dinner, she asked why he was so anxious and restless. Timmy began to open up. A few years ago, after Timmy's mother passed away, his father became silent and started drinking, which later evolved into alcoholism. He would start drinking as soon as he got home from work. Eventually, his boss caught him drinking on the job, and he was fired. His father felt guilty towards Timmy, swore to quit drinking, but failed to keep his promise. Instead, his drinking intensified, and he even participated in drinking competitions, using the prize money for household expenses. One day, after a bout of dry retching, his father spat out some bloody mucus. The next morning, Timmy found beer cans scattered on the ground, covered in a sticky, jelly-like substance with a foul smell. 
Two days later, his father started to change drastically. He looked like a soap opera in the afternoon, and he asked Timmy to close all the curtains and buy him beer. From then on, Timmy would bring a box of beer for his father every day. His father became photophobic, and dark spots appeared on his skin. His father asked him to turn the heat up to the maximum and warm the beer for him. He even discovered that one day his father wrapped himself from head to toe with a blanket, and a large amount of mucus slipped from his body. By this time, the sheriff and the doctor had already arrived at Timmy's house. They walked up to the second floor in the dark. The room was filled with garbage and the stench was overwhelming. The sight was so grotesque that it made the two of them feel sick. The room was everywhere covered with a mold that looked like cotton wool and there were animal bones on the floor. The doctor couldn't help but vomit. Meanwhile, Timmy continued his revelation to the supermarket owner. His father couldn't be satisfied with the ordinary food. He was starving and started to eat alive animals, and then even humans. At that moment, the doctor and sheriff discovered human bones in the room and decided to leave immediately. Just then, a huge monster appeared behind them. The sheriff fired several shots at the monster's belly, but it didn't flinch. It grabbed the sheriff and took a bite. The doctor was shocked as the monster began to split and multiply. The doctor rushed back to the supermarket to urge the supermarket owner to escape. However, she was stunned by the rate of the monster's multiplication. At this rate, it would only take six days for it to bring about the end of the world. Just then, the roof of the supermarket broke. The monster reached up and took the doctor away. It turns out, Timmy was out finding food for his father and bringing his more victims. The third story, titled Bad Wolf Down, begins with a group of American soldiers being forced by Nazis into a gloomy forest. Two soldiers get killed, while the rest, in a panic, take refuge in a house deep in the woods. The Nazis don't pursue them for a while, and the Americans can finally take a breath. The furniture in the house suggests it was once a police station. Unintentionally, the sergeant steps on a corpse, causing a young soldier to vomit on the spot. Amidst the chaos, a barely alive policeman tries to rise, as if to say something, but his throat is slit and he can't utter a word. He takes his last breath in a matter of moments. After receiving news of his son's death, the leader of a Nazi troop rushes back from the front lines, swearing over his son's body to avenge his death and ensure the Americans meet a cruel end. Meanwhile, the American soldiers are discussing their strategy when a pair of hands suddenly reach out from behind the young soldier. He fires a shot instinctively, only to realize he has wounded a civilian woman. Overwhelmed by guilt, the captain wants to help her, but the sergeant stops him, arguing that the gunshot must have revealed their location and they need to act quickly. The young soldier, however, is not ready to give up. He reaches for the cell keys and finally opens the door, only for the woman to resist, seemingly not wanting them to approach. She speaks in German, which the young soldier doesn't understand. The medic translates for them. She wants them to leave or she will kill them. Fearing the woman's screams might reveal their location, the sergeant wants to dispose of her, but the young soldier and the captain step in to protect her. In response, the sergeant locks his comrades and the woman in the cell and makes his escape. Suddenly, the medic is shocked to see the woman's gunshot wound healing by itself. He then translates the woman's words. It turns out that she is cursed, turned into a werewolf, and has killed many. She doesn't want anyone else to get hurt because of her, so she locked herself in the cell, seeking only death. Upon hearing this, everyone carefully observes the bloody footprints on the ground, which indeed resemble those of a wolf. Finally, the young soldier understands that the woman didn't want to harm him, but was after the cross he was wearing. At this moment, the call of the Nazi leader echoed from outside. He was intent on avenging his only son's death. He was urging the American soldiers to come out and meet their death, otherwise he would torture them until they died. The American soldiers were in despair. A young soldier took off the pure silver cross from his neck and handed it to a woman. The woman swallowed the cross whole. The captain asked the woman to do something for them. The captain spoke to the Nazi leader, challenging him to bring it on. After the captain finished speaking, he had the woman bite both him and his man. As the sun was setting, the woman closed her eyes in relief. The American soldiers began to transform, turning into werewolves. Meanwhile, German soldiers in gas masks stormed into the police station, only to be shocked at the sight. The Nazi leader ordered them to open fire, but the transformed soldiers were invincible, their bodies impervious to blades and bullets. They easily overpowered the Nazi leader and his men. 
Several kilometers away, the selfish sergeant desperately ran to the rendezvous point, only to step into a minefield. He was blown apart, losing all his limbs. The captain, who had reverted back to human form, approached him. The sergeant desperately flattered the captain, pleading for his shitty life. The captain sneered, saying just as the sergeant had said, war can indeed change a person. The fourth story, titled The Finger, begins with a man who has a hobby of picking up discarded items. He often finds little trinkets thrown away or abandoned by the roadside. One day he found a finger on the ground, and with great interest he took it home. The man was constantly suffocated by his mortgage payments, and his job was less than satisfactory. Three years ago he bought this house after divorcing his wife. When he got home, the man began to search online for information about the finger, but he couldn't figure out what animal it belonged to. It could be from some type of bird. The man accidentally spilled some alcohol on the finger and something strange happened. The finger quickly absorbed the alcohol. The man carefully put the finger in a box and stored it in the refrigerator. The next day, he discovered that the finger had disappeared. He searched all over his house and finally found the finger on the floor. However, the finger had now grown into two. When he reached out to pick it up, the fingers gripped his back. Surprisingly, a day later, the fingers had grown into an arm. The man put the arm in the freezer and locked it. Three days later, he heard the sound of glass breaking in the storage room. Upon checking, he discovered that the freezer lock had been broken, the arm was gone, and a window was shattered. In the middle of the night, the man was awakened by a noise. Thinking it was a burglar, he took a gun to the storage room. Upon opening the freezer, he found a blood-soaked creature curled up inside, still alive. He shut the freezer and noticed a bloody heart on the table. Just then, there was a frantic knocking at the door. It was two detectives. It turned out the man's ex-wife had died unexpectedly in her own apartment. The man put on a facade of grief, but he was not sad at all. He knew that the police had come to him because they couldn't find any of his ex-wife's other relatives. After the detectives left, he caught sight of the creature jumping into the sink. Gathering his courage, he found and saw the creature drinking water. The creature noticed him too. The man was so scared that he fell off his chair. However, he realized that the creature meant him no harm and seemed to understand his words, so he happily named it Bob. The man took care of Bob like a parent, cleaning up after him, and even brought him popcorn when Bob was watching a show. One day he received a call from his debt collector. After cursing and hanging up, he scared Bob with his actions. Seeing this, the man quickly explained to Bob and comforted him. One day, the man was picking up money from the ground when a driver nearly hit him. He began to curse out loud, and the driver got out of his vehicle to argue back. That night, Bob killed the driver for the man. Then Bob mysteriously disappeared for a few days. Upon his return, Bob brought back a tongue which belonged to the debt collector. Later in the evening, two detectives paid another visit, demanding photos of the man's ex-wife's children. This was another one of Bob's deeds. After the detectives left, the man, in a fit of rage, took an axe to the skulls of his ex-wife's children, indicating that he is the one who committed all these and blamed it on his imaginary friend, Bob. At that moment, the sound of police sirens rang out from outside. The man was subsequently committed to a mental hospital. He said he couldn't kill or chase away Bob because Bob only wanted to get rid of those who had harmed him, and he believed this was Bob's love for him. He was confident that Bob would come looking for him, and no one could stop Bob. It was only a matter of time. The fifth story, titled The Companion, begins with a young boy named Harold, sitting by the creek while fishing. His friend, Chubby, noticed the injuries on his face and asked if his brother had done it. Harold confirmed it was his brother, but added that he'd given as good as he got. Chubby suggested that he should hide for a while, inviting him to spend the night at his house. But Harold knew that running away would only make things worse, so he declined Chubby's offer. Not long after Chubby left, Harold's ruffian brother arrived. He tossed Harold's bike off the bridge, preparing to continue their brawl. Harold pleaded with his brother to leave him alone, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. And so the chase was on. They ran through the creek and into the woods. As the evening settled, Harold found himself in a graveyard. There stood a tall scarecrow, oddly enough with a cane stuck into its chest. Harold heard his brother's voice again. His brother had entered the graveyard as well, so Harold continued his flight. Suddenly a dark figure darted by, and he ran into a nearby house, locking the door behind him. 
A heavy pounding sound came from outside the door. Harold spotted his brother still searching for him in the distance, but the scarecrow from the cross was gone. Suddenly, dry branches like hands reached in through the gap, grabbing the doorknob and the door swung open. Terrified, Harold fled upstairs, but accidentally fell through the staircase into the basement. The scarecrow had come to life. Harold scrambled up and noticed a mummy on a chair with a note underneath it. According to the note, the farmer's wife, who he had shared his life with for 40 years, had passed away due to illness. After his wife's death, the farmer felt very lonely. Unable to bear the situation, he decided to create a companion. He used straw and bones dug up from the fields to make a scarecrow, but he always felt something was missing. So he used his wife's belongings to form the heart of his creation. One day, the farmer found that his companion had come to life. Frightened, he dropped his water cup, but his companion picked it up for him. At first, the farmer thought everything was fine, until one day a young girl wandered into the fields. The scarecrow cruelly killed this innocent girl, filling the farmer with guilt. So he pierced the scarecrow's heart with his walking stick and ended his own life too. By this time, Harold finished reading the note, the scarecrow had burst through the door and entered the basement. The young boy picked up a shotgun, ready to fire at the scarecrow, but the gun was out of ammo. Terrified, he tried to flee but was tripped up by the scarecrow. Just as the scarecrow was about to kill him, he lifted the farmer's walking stick. And then a miracle happened. The scarecrow knelt before him. Harold realized that the scarecrow was afraid of the very stick that had once killed it. He drove the stick into the scarecrow's heart once more and then left the farm. When he got home, the young boy quickly found some needle and thread and sewed his brother's blanket onto his mattress. Then he woke his brother up. His brother, ready to lash out at him, found that he couldn't move. Then Harold pointed his walking stick at his brother and obediently, the scarecrow extended its demonic claw towards the brother. The sixth story, titled Night of the Paw, begins with a wanted female fugitive who was on the run, driving recklessly, and accidentally tumbled down a hillside. Fortunately, her life was not in danger. She picked up a pistol and stopped in front of a mansion. Inside the mansion, an old man was muttering some words while holding a monkey's paw. At that moment, the woman knocked on the door. The old man opened it, and the exhausted woman collapsed into his arms. The old man treated a wound on the woman's abdomen and amputated two of her broken fingers. Upon waking, the woman got up to retrieve her ring, intending to wear it on her left ring finger, only to find her ring finger missing. Just then, the old man appeared, whistling. The woman aimed her gun at him, blaming him for her missing fingers. The old man said he had saved her life and she should appreciate his help. But she told him to cut the chatter and hand over his car keys to save his own dying life. Surprisingly, the old man said that he very much wanted to die and that she can take his car when he is dead tomorrow morning. He then asked her to join him for a drink tonight and he had a gift for her. Suspicious, the woman followed the old man into the living room. The old man declared that her arrival was all part of his plan because today was his late wife's birthday. For the past 47 years, he had remained faithful to his wife. He then took a small box from a drawer. Inside was a monkey's paw. The old man said there was a rumor about an Indian ascetic who had cast a spell on this monkey's paw. It could fulfill three wishes of its owner. When the paw clenched into a fist, it indicated that all three wishes had been granted. The old man admitted he hadn't believed it at first, but when his wife's third wish came true, he was fully convinced. His family has run a funeral home for generations, but by his time, the business was on the brink of bankruptcy. His wife held the monkey's paw and made their third wish to grant their family wealth beyond their needs. True to their hopes, they became wealthy a week later, but at a terrible cost. His wife left him forever. She had an accident and fell off a ladder while decorating the Christmas tree. Her death brought a substantial life insurance payout, making the family rich. The woman thought it was a coincidence, but the old man hinted at the possibility of something more. It turns out, after his wife's death, each day felt like a year for the old man, filled with unbearable anguish. One day he took out the monkey's paw and prayed for his wife to come back to life. Quickly, one of the monkey paw's fingers curled in. But despite his long wait, no miracle happened. Several weeks later, while testing a coffin, the old man suddenly saw the ghost of his wife. This made him realize that his wife was trapped in the resting coffin, her body unable to emerge. That night, the old man drove to the graveyard and started digging. 
Upon opening the coffin, he found his wife's body had started to decay. Despite this, he gave her a kiss. As he turned away, his wife suddenly grabbed him, taking a bite out of his leg. The old man screamed in pain, picked up the shovel, and started to defend himself. As he saw her severed hand crawling towards the monkey's paw, he quickly picked it up and made a wish for his wife to rest in peace. In the following weeks, he blamed himself, believing it was his fault that his wife couldn't be resurrected. After the story, the woman thought the old man was speaking nonsense. The old man wanted to show her the bite on his leg, but she rejected him every time. Early the next day, the woman prepared to leave the mansion. Before she left, she asked the old man why he had saved her. The old man replied that he didn't save her. He asked the monkey's paw to bring him a killer to end his painful life. Suicide is a sin too grave, so he simply couldn't do it himself. The woman stated she wasn't a killer, but the old man countered that he had been following her story and knew that she had killed someone before. It turns out the woman's husband had a terminal illness and begged her to end it all. Tearfully, after a final kiss with her husband, the woman ended his life. The old man handed the monkey's paw to the woman, pleading for her help. But to his shock, she threw the monkey's paw into the fireplace. The old man rushed to retrieve it, his entire arm catching fire. He begged the woman to shoot him. Witnessing the old man's agonizing pain, she pulled the trigger. Strangely enough, the moment the bullet was fired, the flames engulfing the old man were extinguished. After thanking her, the old man took his final breath. Lifting the old man's trouser leg, the woman discovered bite marks, finally believing his words. In a rush, the woman grabbed the monkey's paw and left the mansion, jumping into a car. She couldn't find the car keys. Suddenly, the sun visor flipped down and the keys fell out. The monkey's paw closed one finger. Now that she finally had the keys, the car wouldn't start. Moments later, the car roared to life and the monkey's paw closed another finger. It turns out she had used up two chances. She arrived at the hospital morgue and found her husband's body. Pulling out the monkey's paw, she wished to revive her husband. Just when she thought her wish wouldn't come true, the lights in the morgue went out and all the corpses sat up. Her husband sat up and gave her a bloody tongue massage. Blood splattered and the woman stopped struggling. Meanwhile, the monkey's paw clenched into a fist. The woman's three wishes were finally granted. The seventh story, titled Times is Tough in Musky Holler, begins with the town's mayor leaning against the jail cell door, shouting at the world outside that they have got the wrong man. The other prisoners, however, are considerably more subdued than him. A family of clergy prays ceaselessly, seeking absolution, while the new sheriff, Deke, and an innocent woman smoke their last cigarettes on the side. Just then, the female warden and her deputies approach. Unmoved by the mayor's claims, she curtly told him to save his breath because he is not the mayor anymore. At this, the innocent woman is so frightened that she wets herself. As the warden continues to list the prisoner's charges, she leads them to the basement of the football stadium. There, they are tied to chairs which hang from chains. A heated argument erupts between Sheriff Deke and one of the prison guards, with Deke berating the guard that he and his father are both cowards. However, the guard retorts that Deke raped his sister and killed his father, and in his eyes, his father is still the sheriff in this town. The prisoners are then hoisted up in their chairs. Ironically, even the previously defiant mayor is scared into wetting himself. Like moles in a game, they poke their heads out of the ground one by one. The stadium is packed to the rafters, and cameras focus on the mayor's head. With a grand flourish, he delivers his last speech, saying that they should thank him for being able to sit here in peace today. As he sees the residents flipping him off, he grows furious, revealing his true nature. He furiously denounces the townsfolk as stupid beasts, declaring that he is always the only king of this town. It's then revealed that a while ago, many zombies started crawling out of their graves for reasons unknown. This plunged the townsfolk into panic. The city council planned to request assistance from the National Guard, but their meeting was abruptly interrupted by the mayor and his men. In just a few days, the mayor managed to round up anyone who could potentially oppose him and imprison them underneath the sports field, declaring himself the seer of the future. He claimed that those leaders who could not foresee the future must pay the price for the townsfolk's lost loved ones. From that point on, the mayor's rule began. Politicians, doctors, police officers, anyone who dared to challenge his authority were sent to prison. Moreover, he designed a twisted game, forcing everyone to watch. 
Now, the townspeople are ready to fight back against the mayor's rule, to give these wicked rulers a taste of their own medicine by broadcasting the creation of live human pies. At the signal, the zombies were released from their cages. One by one, they charged at the reporters who spread fake news, the pastor's family who preached the mayor as a god, and the police who sided with the police department. Then came the innocent woman, who fell victim to rumors, followed by the former sheriff charging at Sheriff Deke. Finally, it was the mayor's turn. The former mayor approached him and delivered him a French kiss. In a blink, the mayor's face was stripped to the bone. Thus, all the live human pies were ready. The eighth story, titled All Hallows' Eve, begins on Halloween night when the boy Pete dresses up and hits the streets, meeting up with his fellows of his bully gang. They go from neighbor to neighbor asking for sweets. His younger brother, feeling he's grown up, no longer wants to trick or treat in his ghostly attire. Pete reassures him that this is the last time, promising that after today, they can finally discard their silly costumes. Their first stop is at a middle-aged man's house. Seeing them, the man panics and immediately offers up a whole bucket of lollipops. But the bully girl in her red outfit and the bully boy with his skeleton mask aren't satisfied. At their second stop, they arrive at the next house. They enter without knocking, but the wife seems accustomed to this. She serves them warm pancakes, inviting them to enjoy. The bully girl, however, complains about the blueberry flavor. Suddenly, the husband runs out, ignoring his wife's protests and curses them as devils, accusing them of bullying the neighbors every year and then swaggering off. Pete is not wanting to stir up trouble, so he urges his friends to leave quickly. But the husband chases after them, shouting at them to leave the neighbors alone because their lives had been ruined. But Pete replies, only when they're finished. They pass an abandoned treehouse, a place that seems to carry many of their fond memories. After a moment of melancholy, they head towards Eddie's house. They knock several times, but there's no response from inside. They decide to start causing mischief. They break the window and enter the room, finding Eddie's mom gripping a shotgun, insisting her son had gone to his grandmother's house and wouldn't be back for a month. She orders them to leave immediately or else she'll shoot. But Pete shows no fear, saying that they need her son to break the cycle cursed on them. After a tense standoff, Eddie's mom puts down the shotgun, saying that she can't take it anymore, because year after year she's watching these guys take other kids away one by one and is worried that her son will be the next victim. At that moment, Eddie ran out, picking up a shotgun, ready to open fire on Pete and the others. Just as Eddie was loading the bullet, Pete snatched the gun away. A few of them dragged Eddie out the door. Eddie's cries attracted the attention of the neighbors, who peeked through their curtains, but none dared to intervene. Afterwards, they tied Eddie to a tree, gathered some branches, and doused them with gasoline. Eddie began to plead that it was just a Halloween prank, and no one was supposed to get hurt. He even called on Pete's brother to testify. So the brother stepped forward and lifted his ghost costume from his head. Eddie screamed out in fear. Pete pulled out a match and asked Eddie if he still remembered that it's him who started all this. It's revealed that many years ago, on the eve of Halloween, the young friends of the bully gang were having a gathering in their treehouse. When they were ready to go down for treats, they found that the treehouse door wouldn't open. Suddenly, through the gaps in the wooden hut, they saw Eddie and a few other bad kids taunting them from below, calling them losers. Eddie then lit a match and threw it under the treehouse. The lawn quickly caught fire. Pete and the others wanted to escape, but the door wouldn't open. In the end, they perished in the fire, and Eddie was also trapped in the inferno. Having done all this, Pete and the others felt a great weight lifted. The bully girl kissed Pete, promising to meet him in dreams. Pete then lifted his brother's ghost costume, revealing an adorable young face. Holding his brother, Pete said that he loved him and wished they had more time together. Then, they all walked into the graveyard and vanished. Now, they could finally rest in peace. It turns out that Pete and the others were spirits, and only after eliminating all the boys who killed them could their souls truly rest. The ninth story, titled The Man in the Suitcase, begins with a young man named Justin taking a flight. After the plane landed, Justin couldn't find his luggage. Seeing the passengers in the hall leaving, Justin became anxious. Just as he was about to go to the duty office to inquire, a suitcase suddenly popped out of the conveyor belt. Justin hesitated for a moment, but eventually took the suitcase and left. As he walked away, his clothes and damaged suitcase appeared behind him. 
On the way home, Justin started a video chat with his girlfriend, who scolded him for his lack of ambition and told him not to contact her anymore. Feeling extremely depressed, Justin returned to his residence, had a snack, and turned on the TV to pass the time. Suddenly, the suitcase on the floor moved, and a cry for help came from within. Justin's first reaction was that his roommate was playing a prank on him. Opening the suitcase cautiously, he was completely stunned to find what's inside is a mysterious but bald man named Baldy. Baldy asked Justin to help him turn his face around so he could talk to him. Baldy explained that he was stuffed into the suitcase because he had offended someone. Justin offered to take him to the hospital, but Baldy disagreed, saying he might encounter his enemies there. He begged Justin to help him out of the suitcase. Baldy instructed Justin to start pulling him out by his feet. As Baldy screamed, a gold coin emerged. Baldy explained that he would produce gold coins when he felt pain. He even said that all the gold coins produced during the process will belong to Justin. After hearing this, Justin dragged the suitcase back to his bedroom. At the break of dawn, Justin took his gold coin and headed for the pawn shop. The shop owner paid him over $200 and took his coin. His roommate claimed he was swindled, asserting the coin was worth at least $300. He asked Justin if he had more coins. Together, they headed home where they bumped into Justin's girlfriend who was there to pick up her things. To their surprise, she accused Justin of being a murderer. Hearing this, roommate immediately ran inside and mustered up the courage to open a suitcase. Baldy, who was hiding inside, gave him quite a fright. Justin and his girlfriend approached, planning to let Baldy out. To their astonishment, Baldy spat out another gold coin when he's in pain. Roommate picked it up, called the others out, and declared they were about to strike it rich. Justin and his girlfriend wanted to let Baldy out, but Roommate disregarded them, moving the suitcase to the top of the stairs and kicking it down. A flood of gold coins burst from the suitcase, leaving the trio stunned. Justin decided to compromise, suggesting they keep Baldy there for 48 hours, then set him free. Thereafter, the three used various methods to torment Baldy into spewing more gold coins. They paid their rent with the money they got from the coins, bought new clothes, and began to live a life of hedonistic excess. But it wasn't long before they grew impatient with the slow rate of their newfound wealth, resorting to shocking Baldy to force him to produce more coins. Watching Baldy in excruciating pain, Justin started to soften, worrying that Baldy might not survive. But the girl and roommate, who were already intoxicated by their newfound wealth, didn't care about any of this. Ignoring Justin's opposition, they increased the current to shock Baldy more. Seeing he couldn't persuade them, Justin grabbed his phone ready to call the police. But his girlfriend snatched it from him, smashing it to pieces in a few quick moves. She also hit Justin over the head, making his head bleed. Unfazed by this, she prepared to hit him again. Unable to withstand the blow, Justin collapsed and tumbled down the stairs. Roommate and the girl prepared to make their big getaway. Before they left, they managed to extract a large sum of money from Baldy. At this point, golden light emanated from Baldy's eyes, and he bitterly said that the world wouldn't tolerate their wickedness. But they turned a deaf ear, further increasing the electric current. After a powerful surge, smoke billowed from the box and a demon stepped out. The pair screamed in fright. Then, two open suitcases appeared before them. It seems that they were about to stuff this greedy duo into suitcases. Following this, the room echoed with their heart-wrenching wails. The next day, Justin was lying on a hospital bed. A card was tucked among the flowers on the table. It read that if Justin ever needs anything, he'll be there to help. At this time, Baldy arrived at the airport with around 20 suitcases, each containing a greedy person. The suitcases holding Justin's girlfriend and roommate were put on the conveyor belt, heading towards an uncertain but definitely unpleasant future, while Justin was spared because of his final act of kindness. The tenth story, titled Skin Crawlers, begins with an overweight guy named Chubby being invited to Dr. Sloan's new technology promotion event. In the promotional video, a lady host who was over 300 pounds three days ago turned into a slender beauty. Chubby was shocked, and even more so when he found the host herself standing in front of him. The host told him that as a loyal customer of the center, he was fully qualified to be one of the first customers to undergo this new treatment. Chubby started a conversation with a greasy girl named Kelly, who was even heavier than him. Hearing that they could meet Dr. Sloan in person, Kelly said she didn't care about the doctor at all. As long as she could become as thin as the host, it wouldn't matter who was involved. 
Just as they were talking, Dr. Sloan appeared. He beckoned everyone to come over. Just 15 minutes ago, a man covered in excess weight walked out of the operating room with a slim and muscular figure, stunning all the overweight observers. Dr. Sloan confidently stated that the new procedure was suitable for everyone. He pulled back the curtain to reveal a giant fish tank in front of everyone. Everyone crowded around to see what was inside. An ugly creature suddenly stuck to the glass. Dr. Sloan explained that this was a female lamprey they had collected from a South American water reserve. It was a higher form of leech, and unlike regular leeches, it didn't suck blood. When it comes into contact with human skin, it secretes a fluid that paralyzes the patient's skin and then painlessly liquefies the fat with its saliva. The rest of the body tissue would not be consumed. He went on to say that losing weight through exercise and dieting was already out of fashion, and this was the most efficient way to lose weight. After hearing this, most of the overweight folks eagerly signed up, except for Chubby. Dr. Sloan began to persuade him, saying that they've already been approved by the medical board and have done countless experiments. No matter what Dr. Sloan said, Chubby was still repulsed by the disgusting leech. He picked up a free burger and left. Two weeks later, Chubby was munching on food when a spicy lady boldly approached him. Chubby recognized her. It was Kelly, the plump girl. In just two weeks, Kelly had transformed so much that she could easily be mistaken for a model. Indeed, Dr. Sloan had hired Kelly as a promotional model. Excited, Kelly said that it's truly miraculous, absolutely painless, and she'll introduce this new treatment on a live broadcast tomorrow. This piqued Chubby's interest. He visited the TV station and learnt from the host that the boss there had also undergone the procedure, as had half the staff. When the live broadcast began, the host first announced the news of the day's total solar eclipse. The reporter was providing live coverage of the eclipse. He reminded viewers to keep a close eye on their pets, as the eclipse could cause fluctuations in the magnetic field, potentially making animals agitated. After the commercial break, the camera focused on Chubby and a leech. The leech was exceptionally lively, twisting and turning inside its glass enclosure. Kelly suddenly felt a headache. Backstage, the camera was switched to the reporter, who appeared uncomfortable. Just as the eclipse reached totality, the reporter suddenly turned his back to the camera and fell to his knees. Shortly after, his head started to explode. Simultaneously, a small leech crawled out from Kelly's eye. Then, numerous leeches poured from Kelly's eyes and mouth, followed by the staff of the weight loss center. The cameraman started spewing out a large number of leeches. In shock, Dr. Sloan told the cameraman to stop filming and insisted to the camera that their treatment is safe. Chubby got furious and chastised Dr. Sloan, accusing him of prioritizing profit over patient safety. Dr. Sloan protested, saying it wasn't like that. He was certain that the solar eclipse had affected the magnetic field. He claimed that they had conducted many experiments, but had never considered the negative effect brought by the solar eclipse. Just then, Dr. Sloan's stomach began to churn violently. Soon, he was motionless. Chubby moved closer to check on him. He then heard noises from Dr. Sloan's stomach. He took a step back, only to find leech eggs burst through the doctor's abdomen like a fountain, splashing all over him. He removed his glasses, slipped, and fell. Then, a giant leech crawled out from Dr. Sloan's body, eagerly eyeing Chubby's ample flesh. The GPS tentacles of the leech coiled around Chubby's greasy leg. Chubby got up and pushed the nearby vending machine towards the leech. Finally, the leech was motionless. Afterwards, Chubby picked up a piece of nougat from the ground, popped it into his mouth, and gave a smile that only victors wear. The 11th story, titled Lydia Lane's Better Half, begins with a shot of a successful businesswoman named Lydia. Her corporation is set to become the wealthiest private equity group in the country. She is planning to step down from her position as CFO, but her potential successor, Tom, doesn't seem too confident. In contrast, her other employee named Celia appears certain she'll get the job. However, unexpectedly, Lydia hands the opportunity to Tom, which frustrates Celia. Celia and Lydia are lovers, and she accuses Lydia of never intending to promote her. Lydia explains that she did this because she doesn't want to lose Celia and hopes they can spend more time together. Once the public stock offering is over, they will be very wealthy and can do anything they want. However, Celia has a different vision. She has always seen the position of CFO as the beginning of her life and accuses Lydia of being a liar. Lydia tries to calm her down. As Celia's temper flares, her words become more offensive. 
Lydia is unable to bear it any longer and slaps Celia, who becomes furious and threatens to expose her violent behavior to the press, thereby ruining her reputation. In anger, Lydia pushes Celia away, but this results in a fatal accident. The trophy stabs into the back of Celia's head, causing a flow of blood. Seeing the employees leave to celebrate with Tom, Lydia lifts Celia onto an office chair to move her. On the way, she bumps into Tom, who she finally manages to send away. When she returns to the conference room, she finds that Celia's drooping head has suddenly straightened, and she is glaring at her. This scares Lydia, who quickly closes Celia's eyes and pushes her into the elevator shaft. In relief, Lydia begins to plan how to frame Celia's death as a car accident. At this moment, the elevator starts to shake violently, causing her to fall to the ground, and the office chair with Celia on it rolls directly onto her. After some while, the elevator finally stops. Lydia tries to call for help, but her phone has no signal. She manages to pry open a gap, only to find that the elevator is stuck between floors. She pulls the office chair over, steps on it, and opens the ceiling hatch. Just as she's about to celebrate her small victory, she falls heavily from the office chair. At 3 a.m., Lydia was awakened by someone calling her name. It was Celia, her eyes wide open, glaring at her angrily. Startled, Lydia tried to shut Celia's eyes, but Celia's mouth eerily fell open. Suddenly, an emergency announcement blared from the elevator speakers. A major magnitude earthquake had struck the Los Angeles basin. Response teams were dispatched to every building. As the aftershock hit, the elevator started to plummet. Lydia could hear a firefighter's voice from the intercom system. Worried that the arriving firefighters would discover Celia, she quickly covered her mouth. She picked up her phone to illuminate the scene, finding Celia staring at her, causing her to scream out in fear. The firefighter on the line urged Lydia to stay calm and promised to arrive as quickly as possible. But in a frenzy, Lydia began to mock that Celia couldn't become her, even though she had attended the Wharton Business School. She is the only one who controls the entire business empire, and she is always the winner. The next evening, Lydia was awakened by the firefighter's voice. She had been trapped in the elevator for 24 hours. Then, something strange happened. The trophy, lodged in the back of Celia's head, inexplicably popped out. Lydia crawled over to Celia with contempt, intending to inspect the wound, but suddenly a hand reached out from it and tightly grasped her throat. It took a great deal of effort for her to escape, leading her to believe she was hallucinating. She wanted to get out of there by any means necessary. She pried the elevator doors open and yelled for help, then grabbed onto the grid in preparation to climb out. But Celia rose and grabbed hold of Lydia's hair. The elevator began to plummet again. After a scream, Lydia was silent. Blood began to trickle down the elevator. When the firefighters opened the elevator doors, they found Celia holding Lydia's head, a triumphant smile on her face. They suspected that Lydia had tried to climb out, but her leg was entangled in an office chair. The twelfth story, titled By the Silver Water of Lake Champlain, begins with the radio station reporting a lockdown of all waterway traffic on Champlain Lake. Elsewhere, a girl named Rose dug up a newspaper clipping from 1977, reporting sightings of a lake monster by six people. She remarked that the temperature of the lake that day was the same as today's, much lower than usual. Her mother interrupted her, insisting that the lake monster didn't exist, and asked her to stop bringing it up. Rose's younger brother chimed in, saying that their father used to say that the foghorn was the yawn of the Champlain Lake monster before it went to sleep. Their mother asked both of them to stop the bullshit, which upset the stepfather when he heard about it. Upon seeing Thomas, a boy who was pursuing her, Rose quickly hid, seemingly not wanting him to see her in her current state. Then the stepfather came out from the other room. He drew a dagger from Thomas's waist and started waving it threateningly in front of him. Thomas was scared and closed his eyes. The stepfather warned Thomas that he had once killed a Vietnamese soldier and that he was the only man allowed in their house. He ordered Thomas to leave. After Thomas left, the stepfather continued to pick a fight. He complained about having to work hard outside to support the family, only to come home to cold food. Rose could not hold back anymore and retorted that he was just out drinking at the bar. This angered the stepfather, who grabbed a notebook about the Champlain Lake monster left by Rose's father and threw it on the floor, dismissing it as trash. Crying, Rose told her mother that the stepfather was only using her and only showed up after her father's insurance payout was received. But the mother said that her father had wasted all their savings and his entire life searching for the lake monster. 
The townsfolk thought he was crazy, and he completely neglected them until he sank to the bottom of the lake. Interrupting her mother, Rose said that her father didn't care whether the townsfolk believed him or not. He searched every night because he hoped his wife would believe him. After saying this, Rose stormed out of the house. Not understanding what was going on, her younger brother and Thomas followed her, running after her. Rose ran all the way to the lake in one breath. In the thick fog, she was tripped by something and bumped her forehead. Rose examined the object in front of her and quickly flipped through the records of the Champlain Lake monster. Her father had always been right. This was indeed the creature of the Champlain Lake. But at this moment, the lake monster was already dead. Thomas mentioned that with this, she would become famous. However, Rose wished that everyone could know that the one who discovered the lake monster was her father. She asked her brother to run back and call their mother, and she took a photo of Thomas with the lake monster. She knew that if her father were here, he would have documented it in the same way. The brother ran back home, yelling all the way. On hearing his words, their stepfather ran towards the lake. Rose told Thomas about a morning when their father went fishing by the lake while ignoring the fog warning. The next day, when the fog cleared, their father was washed ashore. He remained silent for days after waking up, and when he finally spoke, he claimed that the Champlain Lake monster was real. But their mother argued with him, pleading with him to stop talking about the lake monster as people in town thought he had lost his mind. To prove his words, their father would go out searching night after night until one morning, when he was washed ashore again, but this time he never woke up. After hearing this, Thomas used a dagger to engrave the names of Rose and her father on the body of the lake monster. Now no one could steal this credit. Thomas asked Rose to take another photo so that her father's name could make it to National Geographic. At that moment, the stepfather suddenly stormed over, ready to claim the credit for himself. Rose disagreed, insisting the credit belonged to her father because he found the lake monster. The stepfather argued that he has had enough of her stupid mother and two idiot children, and that the lake monster is going to make him rich. He snatched the photograph, crumpling it into a ball. When Thomas tried to intervene, he was disarmed by the stepfather who took the dagger, intending to carve on the monster. The stepfather began to tease Thomas. Just as he was about to start a fight, Rose bit the stepfather's arm. The stepfather shook her off, picked up the dagger, and pointed it at the two kids. Just then, a massive lake monster appeared behind the stepfather and swallowed him whole, including his smelly part, only spitting out some flesh and the dagger. The monster touched the family's corpses, letting out a mournful cry and dragged the enormous body into the lake. The mother and brother quickly arrived, asking what had happened. Rose explained that the lake monster really exists, and it even saved her and Thomas from the stepfather. The mother still seemed skeptical. However, as she turned around, she saw a massive figure disappearing into the lake. She then realized that the father wasn't crazy after all. Overjoyed, Rose ran into her mother's arms, and they headed home together. At that moment, the lake washed the stepfather's severed leg onto the shore. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.